I have no idea, Paul. I got nothing. I got nothing for today. What do you got, man? Talk to me, Goose. What's up, man? What's up? Um, I, uh, what an active day today was, right? So if, if you were, you know, the, the first four hours of uh, a free agency, you felt like you had your uh, fantasy football draft on auto through Yahoo, where you're like, <laughs> Kevin Johnson? Who's, it, who's this guy? No Frank Gore. <laughs> this is our second round pick. What the hell happened? You know, it was, it was a crazy day. Did I miss something here? Like... Um, but again, I well, I feel like this kind of fits a little bit with what the Bills have going on. You know, like it, they don't seem to be in a rush to do anything, and um, and and part of me is okay with that. It's a slow process. I mean, I, <laughs> I made the comment a little bit earlier today, and I actually tweeted it out, talking about, you know, maybe the Bills with all the cap room that they have, they're going to let all. Everyone else go after the really big fish and sign these huge contracts early, and then they're going to take maybe seven to eight mid-tier guys. But then you had made the comment of their roster. I mean, that's something that we really didn't – we mentioned it a few times in passing, but not really uh, not really explained it in depth. Yeah, you know, when you've got 58 guys on the roster, right, why are you in a rush to sign anybody? You're the first two signings between Frank Gore and, uh, and Kevin Johnson. Nobody's promising these guys roster spots. No, right? These, these aren't these aren't promised spots. You got fifty eight guys on the roster after you sign those two, and then you add Mitch Morris today, and then you add Tyler Cross. So that brings them up to a smooth sixty. So they still have to they still have to sign thirty guys. They're going to draft ten, right? So that means they're going to have twenty undrafted free agents or available free agents, um, and they're going to be done. So they're pretty far along in the process of building out their roster. Um, and again, you, you look at Frank Gore and you look at Kevin Johnson, they're not promised roster spots. Nobody said that they are. Um, we actually don't even have details on Kevin Johnson. I imagine it's not much, right? Given, given his player has dry, I can't imagine that they spent too much money on him. No, I mean, I, I, I made the initial comment of they're probably signing him two to, two to eight, you know, two years for eight million and maybe like a, an additional, you know, year as an option if he could stay out there if he plays like thirty games out of thirty two or twenty eight out of the out of the you know thirty two games for those two years, but it was interesting to see how a lot of the people that we that we were talking about that the Bills should target uh, as far as offensive linemen and certain things of that nature, you know, they went everywhere else. I mean, the Raiders, their checkbook, good lord, man. I mean, Trenton Brown, you got the, the re- renegotiated Antonio Brown's contract a few days ago, and it was one of those things where, all right, they're making all these moves. You know, you see Trenton Brown. I mean, the Trenton Brown signing, you know, some of these signings and some of the things that go on, uh, you almost start to say, okay, all right, that makes sense because look at their division. I mean, they have to contend with Joey Bosa. Right. We don't know the status of D Ford, and they got Bradley Chubb there. So that's one of those things where mm-hmm. you need to have a solid left tackle there to protect Derek Carr. And some just, and the one thing that I made, I you know, I put the little conspiracy hat on. You know how I love doing that. But if you think yeah, if you're the yeah. Bills and you think the Jets are a serious player in your division, you sign Frank Gore, who is just, you know, in Miami with Adam Gase, who could probably give you some. Like I said, it was a very Patriot-like move that they did to sign Frank Gore. But now you have a 36-year-old yeah. running back. And the thirty-one, two thirty-one-year-old running back. Is this is this supposed to be? Because we talk about the Carolina connection all the time. Is this supposed to be the new D'Angelo Williams, uh, Mike Tolbert, and Jonathan Stewart? I mean, what, what, what's going on here with this backfield? Well, you know, I think this kind of signals the end of Chris Ivory, right? Um, because McCoy and Frank Gore are pretty tight, from my understanding. So I, I think this kind of signal signals the end of Chris Ivory's time. On the boat. It was a little surprise to me. I mean, you had to assume that one of them was going to go. Is that going to be McCoy or going to be Ivory? Um, you had to assume one of them was going to get moving. Um, I, Frank Gore replacing either of them was a shock. Um, but you know, Gore does a lot of the little things right still at his age, and he was still a very productive player. So if you're just looking at from a stat perspective, Frank Gore was more statistically proficient than any running back on this team last year. Um, but again, you had a, a terrible offensive line play, you know, for the Bills last season, and and right now the only thing they've really done is they've signed a swing center and guard, and now they brought in Mitch Morris to kind of lock up the middle uh, at 11 mil 
per season, which is a, a crazy number to me for a center. But I, you know, the thing that gets me about that is specific to Mitch Morris is that Mitch Morris was the consolation prize because the Bills were very in on that parodies. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mitch Morris turned into a, a very expensive consolation prize. And I really anticipated them going after a center in the draft. I, there were just a couple guys that I thought they really liked. But stop me if you've heard this one before. The Bills signed a player with an Andy Reid connection. You know, stop, Shocking, stop right? me if you've heard this before. Shocking, right? Uh, I like I, I, I like the Morris signing for two reasons. One, I think he's a quality player. That's number one. I mean, the, the guy. I mean, you have a you have a young, strong arm quarterback, and he's proved himself with Mahomes. Now he has going to a team with another young, strong arm quarterback. I mean, it makes sense. And the thing about it was, I guess rumors were coming out that it was the Bills and the Jets were jockeying for position for Matt Paradis. And what this does now, if you think about it, takes the Bills out of the running for Matt Paradis. But it also says, okay, to the Jets. All right, you're going to have to man up and pay him at least 11 mil. Okay, that being said, with all the signings that the Jets have done, does this take Le'Veon Bell off the table for the Jets? The Jets have spent a lot. Of, <laughs> they've spent a lot of money today. Yes. Um, I I don't think there's any details officially out on the Anthony Barr contract, but uh, that one hurt a little bit. I. I really, really was yes. not. Yeah, I really like the thought of Anthony Barr in Buffalo. I didn't think it was going to happen, but just the thought was kind of nice to fall asleep to at night. <laughs> um, but the Jets today, uh, if we just take a look at, at what they did and what they covered, um, Anthony Barr, uh, Josh Bellamy, uh, Jameson Crowder, Matt Paradis, like they spent they spent a lot of money today. Yeah. A lot. Well, no, another guy that we mentioned quite a bit on our shows is um, C.J. Mosley. Uh, did, did any news come out about him recently? I don't think no, anybody... nothing that I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing that I'm aware of with C.J. Mosley. Um, I will say that um, getting getting back to, to Buffalo real fast, I know uh, on a tight ends episode that we had cut a little while ago, um, we talked a little bit about um, um, Tyler Croft and very, very briefly. I think mm-hmm. you and I talked about it more off the air than, it, than we did on, yeah. but I'm really down with Tyler Croft. I think that is a, I think that's a good signing. Um, here's a kid that was really productive when asked to step up as a starter and this time due to the injury, but I, we're starting to see a trend with being a McDermott, not being afraid of guys who lost major time to injury if they were productive when they were healthy. Right. So yeah. you saw that with EJ Gaines, you saw that with Trent Murphy, we're seeing it again um, here with Tyler Croft. So this is now enough to establish it as a trend, right? Yeah. So am I crazy to think that it is the next big signing that we can expect from the Bills, somebody who missed significant time last season? Because it, it, that's, I think there's enough to say that we've seen a trend at this point. Yeah, we have. I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of any guys that missed any kind of significant time last year. Uh, that the Bills could. I mean, you, you think at some point they probably want to get some guys that are healthy in here. I mean, you got. I mean, Tremaine Edwards missed a game. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Milano missed. You know, he got injured this year. Um, you, you got you got a few of these guys who. I mean, McCoy missed time. You got these guys that can't stay on the field. It's hard to develop any type of consistency and chemistry with the, with the ball club. And um, it's just it's just interesting to see some of the things that go on. Well, especially with some of these signings, uh, Colt signed Funches. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I didn't, right. Seriously, I really uh, did not want him. Yeah, uh, that that scared yeah. me for a little bit. Uh, it was funny too, as you talk about as we circle back to Croft. You know, he signed for a three-year, eighteen million. That's what I thought that they were going to offer Jesse James. I mean, and I wouldn't have been upset with that contract at all. But Croft, as we highlighted before. It's interesting we talked about you had you had done a statistical breakdown of how Dable uses his tight ends and his offense. They're not very productive, you know. They're not highly targeted. So you could think Tyler Croft and Jesse James, those those guys are more of the old school type of tight ends where they're going to be on the end of the line. They're going to serve as more in the run game. And you got a lot of these tight ends that are coming out in the league now. You talk about you know couple of years ago, O.J. Howard. Now you got these guys coming out, uh, Noel Fant and T.J. Hawkinson, who you, I know, are very high on. Uh, they're more receiving threats. They're not really blocking threats. So yeah. it's one of those things where they, they would – that just signals that a defensive coach is going to be thinking about run first, and then you can open up your quarter, quarterback or, or your running backs uh, in the passing game. But 
you get that old school tight end. You sign him three years, you know, six million a year. You don't have to really worry about that position unless he gets injured. So you can start developing chemistry with Josh Allen right away. Yeah, and and more. I think it's it's probably time to start looking at uh, the chat a little bit. So we got a bunch of guys. So thank you so much. Um, a couple of new commenters, which is always great. Thank you guys for joining us. So I want to say uh, thank you to Joel from Believers Talk. We've done we've done an episode with Joel uh, a few months ago. So you definitely want to go check out his channel. He does a lot of stuff during the game. Yes, um, so he's he's live commenting during the game on his channel. So thanks, Joel, for hanging out. Um, he asked, "What's the likelihood of McCoy, Ivory, and?" Gore here to start the 2019 regular season. Um, I got to be honest with you. If Chris Ivory's not cut in the next week, I'd be surprised at this point. It's it's. Something's got to give at that point, right? Uh, I just I just don't foresee Ivory being on this team. You look at those three guys and you say, well, two of you got to play special teams, um, or one of you has got to go. Right, either two of you have to play special teams to remain all three on the roster, or one of you one of you has to go. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where you sit with that. Monster Clubhouse asked, uh, "What wide receivers would we want in free agency?" You had just mentioned Devin, Devin Funchess is now going to Indy. Well, Tyrell Williams was a big target for Indy, but they went with Funchess. So we're starting to see suitors drop off for Tyrell Williams, and the Bills are going to be one of the top contenders for him. He hasn't signed yet. But Buffalo is definitely in the top of the market for Tyrell Williams at this point. We can offer him one of the better situations. We can offer him a lot of money because the Bills didn't really spend much today. No, they didn't. But the thing you have to realize is you're circling back to, once again, Antonio Brown. Antonio obviously wanted a new contract. He wanted new, more guaranteed money. And he ended up getting, I think he's going to be making to the tune of $15 million in 2019. Devin Funches just signed for 13. So where do you think Williams, he's got to think he's better than Devin Funches, but not as good as Antonio Brown. Would you be comfortable paying Tyrell Williams fourteen million dollars a year, who's never been a number one, who has stepped in quite a bit for Keenan Allen, but has never been a, a number one option in the offense in San Diego? Because I got some trepidation on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I see where you're coming from there, but I, you always have to go to comparables, right? So that's when you start looking at money that's out there, you're always looking at comparables. Mm-hmm. So. Adam Humphreys is the first one that comes up. He's similar in age. Adam Humphreys is 26. He just signed four for 36, right? I mean, that's that's up in the market right now. Quincy and That's it. James and Crowder signed three for 28. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that. You know, Devin Funches is one for 10. So, I mean, I don't. The market's starting to fall out from longer term deals. So, I'm not even sure you're can Tyrell away. I think, you know, with the market, there's only been one four-year deal out, been one, three, two, ones, two. So the market's going to fall on out a little from all your deals with the wide receiver position. Yeah, I would. I, this could this could have been one of those things because a lot of people were high initially after the combine on DK Metcalf. If the Bills do not make a run at a wide receiver uh, in the next few days, they're either going to be, as we, as you've said many times, picking guys up off the scrap heap, or they're going to be, they're going to be drafting one. And I'm going to lose a very important bet that that'll be coming up on an episode later this week. But, um, yeah, as far as that goes, what would you, if you had to pay Tyrell Williams and you had to give him a, con- a new contract, what would you be comfortable if you were the GM? What would you be comfortable paying him, coming into here, joining the likes I- of McKenzie? Zay Jones and Robert Foster. Well, you know, it's Tom Hammond mentions Tyrell isn't a number one receiver. He's right, right? So you're yeah. looking at the best of what's left, right? So if we're looking at contracts, to me, if I'm going to pay, if, if, even if I just use Jameson Crowder's contract as the framework, if I'm going three for 25, right? Um, I'd rather give that money to Golden Tate. Yeah. And that's where I am with that, right? So. Um, you know, to me, I'm not in love with Tyrell Williams, although he's definitely, you always have to be careful with free agency, right? Because you can buy expense, you can, you can make an expensive mistake on potential. And that's where I think a lot of people are with Tyrell Williams is you can make an expensive mistake with potential. If I'm looking at this wide receiver group, I need something I can rely on, not something that's a chance. So, uh, 
to me, I'd rather put that money on Golden Tate. I don't love spending that much money on Golden Tate, but the reality is that's where I would be. But I'm more conservative than a lot of other people, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to mention that. No. Um, you know, it's there's a Paul Chandler had mentioned uh, today on uh, one of the YouTube videos asking about Pierre Garcon. I love Pierre Garcon. Yeah. I love him in that veteran role. Um, you know, and you're going to get him on a two year deal for $10 million. Like, now, that's that's where it's going to be. Of the holes that the Bills do have to fill, because we, we had mentioned many times they have a lot of holes they have to fill, mainly on the offensive line. We had talked previously on, on a couple episodes about they need more depth in the secondary. They need a tight end because they got rid of play. What, what if any, in your mind, what did they solve today and what maybe came off the table of guys they would have had to draft? You know, we talked about them getting a, getting a running back in the draft. Um, you know, there's conflicting statements out there. If Ivory does get cut, they're still in play for a running back. And even if he doesn't get cut, do you think – also, do you think they're, they're still in play for a running back at the draft? I, I don't think they're going to draft a tight end. Although t- signing Tyler Croft really doesn't take that off the table. But right now, if you look at it, you got McKenzie, Jones, Croft, and Foster as if you went into a three-wide set with a tight end. And you can put Gore in the backfield because he is a he is a manimal as far as uh, pass protection goes. You know he's real, and the guy you don't stick around the league this long and not know how to pass protect. Um, and like you said, he just takes souls when he runs the ball. I've never seen the guy fall backwards once. Right. Um, and in that in that respect, so you, you got a little bit more depth in the secondary. You have a guy in the center of that line that can quarterback that line. Uh, you got a tight end now that can serve as a in the run game. What, if anything, is taken off of the table at the draft from the Bills that you saw from today? You know, that's a great question. So I'm going to throw part of that over to the chat, right, okay. because I, I think that's a great thing to think about. So my response, and then we can go through some of the responses in the chat as far as that's concerned. So when we take a look at what today solved, Kevin Johnson at this point is is really just a flyer at the DB position. So um, adding more cornerback depth at some point later in the draft is definitely still on the table. The only thing that today really did was Tyler Croft, you're not stopping drafting a tight end, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you're just going to look for a run blocking tight end at this point because Croft is, is more of a pass catcher. Kroom is more of a pass catcher. So now you're going to start looking for, you know, those hammers out there if you're even going to draft a tight end. But, um, you know, that's still on the board for you. Uh, you take a look at Mitch Morris. He's the only one that takes – Bradbury off the table. Um, yeah. Even when you look at some of the other centers that are in the draft, Elgin Jenkins can play guard. He so, can. like, some of the other centers are, are bigger framed guys. The only player that got eliminated today was Garrett Bradbury because he's of the players in that center position, the one that's least likely to be able to move across the line. Outside of that, they've done nothing to take anything else off the table. Every single position except quarterback and safety are still well, well, well in play. And, uh, I mean, Chris Matlock even put in the chat, he said, we need Roger Saffold. That's a name that you and I have been very high on for a number of months now, trying to get that guy in here. Um, here's my question, though. If the Bills decide to go after – because I, I was always of the mindset that they're going to try to go for two tackles. I really think they would have. I mean, you even mentioned it before, the two biggest needs that they should go after is to go after two tackles. What is the likelihood, and maybe I'm asking the question to the wrong guy, I'll throw it over to the chat, but what is the likelihood they go after two tackles to, in fact, move Deion Dawkins to guard and put him next to Morse and then put Long on the other side? Yeah, you know, Mar, I think that's, I think that's a good question, but the reality is that it's often really, really challenging for any NFL team to replace two tackles in one season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Darrell Williams is a name that I keep hearing over and over and over again. Um, uh, JJ Pollock just mentioned Darrell Williams as, as being, you know, somebody that would be targeted very much, right? Very much so. Could you see that happen? Um, Darrell Williams is absolutely a target. Sir Nathan mentioned the same guy. Um, and that's, again, very much in play. And then you can look at, since you're at nine, you very well could get the best tackle on the board mm-hmm. um, sitting at nine. And the Bills clearly aren't sold on a player because they were willing to swap first-round picks with uh, Pittsburgh to get Antonio Brown. They looked at that as saying, okay, well, we're going to get Antonio Brown for swapping a first-round pick and dropping down to 20, and then we could still get insert position that we need here. Again, I'm I'm of the mindset that it's probably an offensive draft for them. Um, And the reason I say that, and you guys can disagree with me on this, but 
I think one of the reasons that the Bills are going to look offense early is really because this is such a defensive heavy draft that that offensive talent is going to get pushed down the board, right? This is a great draft that if you need some tackle help, you're going to be able to get some tackle help a little bit later than you normally would because everybody's going crazy over these linebackers, defensive ends. Um, you know, mm. talking, Hawkinson and, and Fanter talked about as being top 20 picks. You've got a couple quarterbacks that people are going to lose their minds over. So, uh, again, you see the offensive talent slowly being pushed back, and the same could be said for running back. Um, the Bills are very much in play for trading back up into the first and grabbing another running back. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. Um, and I think that a lot of that is, is still very much a possibility for them. Um, what, do, what do you think, Mark? I, I, the, Bills, the Bills love to pound square pegs into round holes at times. I oh, really yeah. think they believe Deion Dawkins is a tackle. So sure. I don't think they're going to replace two tackle positions in one offseason, although I think Dawkins is better suited at his guard. I'm with you there. Yeah. But what do you think that this week has told this just today? What do you think today has told us about how they're going to approach this. Well, the one thing that I was thinking about, if I can go over to the other side of the ball really quick, is talking about Kevin Johnson. And the fact is I kind of got the ghost of Christmas past came up again because the last time they signed a, a former first round pick, he ended up quitting at halftime in the secondary. So mm -hmm. that kind of scared me a little bit. That was the first thing that kind of scared me. But the other thing is now I, I wouldn't be – as nervous as you replacing both tackles if one of them was a veteran and you drafted the other one. I really wouldn't be that worried. I mean, I think still on the market is TJ Lang, who got cut by the Lions. I know you were talking about him yep. before. Um, I would If they have a veteran of like maybe four, five, six years to put in there at that right tackle position and decided to draft their left tackle, I wouldn't be that worried about it. Um, I still think they need to go I – th I still think they need to go with the offensive line, but – that, like you bring up a very interesting point, their willingness to go back from nine to twenty because we had saw, we had said many times, guys don't really only grade about fifteen to eighteen guys as first round talent. So, if the you know if the Bills are thinking that the, they they must think that their guy is still going to be there for them at twenty, if they were going to willing to trade back, or it could have been a smoke screen. He could have offered that, knowing that the Steelers weren't going to take it. Just to, just to kind of put the league on notice and say, hey, the Bills are, are, are willing to trade out of nine. Let's throw our hat in the ring either early or at the draft to see where the Bills will trade out of the first 10 picks. I mean, because we, we, I mean, from a financial standpoint, the first 10 picks are obviously a lot different on the fifth year option than the picks 11 through 32. We've talked about that as well. If you look at the difference between, uh, when you look at the difference between uh, Shaq Thompson, you know, who, who, I think he's still out there. I don't think I don't think anyone's ever signed him yet. I mean, yeah, he's still available. Yeah, yeah, there's still a Carolina connection there. But as far as the offensive line is concerned, you took a big step today in addressing one of the most important positions you would. And I think a lot of people were nervous when the Bills got the former Jet. Uh, they got Long in here. They said, "Well, is he going to play center? Is he going to play guard?" So you may have solved two of your positions already in mm -hmm. the first. And you didn't have to spend a lot of money to do it. And remember. The Bills don't have to spend all of their cap. People always get confused with that. They think the Bills have to spend all of their cap money just to get all these guys in here. They don't really have to. They have Josh Young, who's on a very manageable deal. They have uh, Tremaine Edmonds, who's on a very manageable deal. And you don't have to pay those guys for another four years. So you can you could still roll over money into next year if there happen to be more free agents next year that you like than this year. That's one of those things you can do. And you can just trade back and load up on some more picks and get some more bodies in camp. So um, we, I want to hark it back over to uh, to the chat. We got a lot of again. Thank you everybody for joining. We got uh, a bunch of people watching. So let's. I'm just going to scroll up a little bit and go through some of these comments. Um, so uh, let's start with. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, real quick. I hear a lot of rumblings about AJ Green and the Bengals wanting to trade AJ Green. <laughs> the Bengals organization as a whole is one of those organizations that just loves to take care of their own. I, I'd be real surprised if they trade AJ Green, even with a change in the head coaching. Um, I'd still be shocked to see AJ Green. They they really love to take care of their guys. They've had when they sign guys to extensions, they really don't cut players early unless there's a major issue. I I really I. I struggle to see them trading AJ Green. I just don't see that happening. Um, and Matt had, Chew had mentioned. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What was that? They've had the same GM since 1991. Mike Brown has been. Yeah. He's drafted everybody yeah. that's yeah. been through there. So. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I really think AJ Green 
uh, is very likely a candidate to retire with Cincinnati at this point. So, um, yeah, I just don't see them moving moving on from him. Uh, Matt Chu uh, throws out a huge contract, four years, $46 million to Tyrell Williams. Uh, that would be top of the market. I mean, that you're looking at huge money there. Um, and I just don't see that market there for Tyrell Williams just yet. Um, I, I mean, that's a, that's a huge dollar figure for, for Tyrell Williams. A lot of guys are saying Tyrell isn't a number one. You know, again, it, number one is – I, there's a little bit of perspective you have to put in with the number one wide receiver terminology, but I don't see Tyrell Williams being a guy who could absorb 120 targets for your team, right? If that's what you're classifying as number one receiver, uh, Mario, you're with me on that, right? I just don't see Tyrell Williams as a, as a 120 guy. No, I mean, and the thing that the, the difference that you're, t- I think you're talking about is not just the number one receiver, but number one option on the team. You know, you want to talk yeah. about what is the number one option for the Bills right now? And if if Williams, I mean, four for 45, I mean, we just saw Brown at 31 get three for 50. I mean, if that's if you're putting him in Antonio Brown's category, um, I, I just I respectfully disagree on the fact of their type of play. I don't see them on the same level. Therefore, because that's how a lot of these contracts end up manifesting is the fact that they start to see what your value is. How old are you? What production have you had? What production will you have in the future? And I just don't see Williams having that much of an impact uh, in getting that kind of a contract. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. Uh, Matt Doherty mentions that uh, the Bills probably should have made a harder push to try and get parodies. It is tough to let somebody go within the division, right? Yes. Um, that's a big That's a big thing. So they really had to be sold on the fact that there wasn't that there wasn't $20 million worth of a difference between Matt Paradis and Mitch Moritz. No. Um, that's really what they had to feel. No. Um, because that's, I mean, the Paradis got paid, Morris got paid too, but the Bills clearly felt like the, like the difference between the two um, clearly wasn't high enough, right, to, well, to allow them to go out. Well, like I said earlier, they could have been pushing up the price on Paradis and then sign, yeah. eventually knowing they were going to sign Morris just so the Jets would sign him. Now, Who's going to make a bigger impact on that team? If they don't sign Paradis, they're probably going to go after Bell. And I've heard reports of the Raiders going after Bell. I don't know where they're getting this money from, but if you had to have your decision, if you had to have your choice, do you want Matt Paradis or Le'Veon Bell on the Jets right now and have to face him twice a year? I think you would, you'd rather take care of that. You would like the matchup of Star Latoule or, or Harrison Phillips or, or you know uh, Jordan Phillips there in the front with Paradis than you would who trying to tackle Le'Veon Bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. You know, Bills fan 7883 calls out um, Ed Oliver. Ed Oliver is the second coming of John Randall. That guy is an animal. Yes. Um, could he be there? You know what? You really, <laughs> that's one thing. We, we've been talking about wide receivers. We've been talking about offensive players. But let's not forget that Sean McDermott loves defense, right? And this defensive class is loaded in this draft. Um, and it's going to be real hard for him to to stop himself from trying to take some of these defensive <laughs> players. Because if Ed Oliver just for some reason happens to be there at nine, I always make the joke that, you know, if there's a player that you really, really want, just see if you can get a picture with him in a gas mask uh, and then just say, hold on to it till before the, you know, given the Leal Collins treatment, hold on to it before the draft and, and see if you can get it to slide down the draft board. Um, Ed Oliver being there at nine would be a big shock. Uh, Tom Hampton calls out Hollywood Brown at nine. That's probably a little high for him. But, um, you know, what are the odds that Bills do go defense in this draft and, and go early? Because, you know, yeah, they brought it back Jordan Phillips. Yeah, they have a rotation in that D-line. But you take a look at Shaq Lawson, they still, you know, they, he's got a fifth-year option next year. So this really could possibly be his last year. Yes. Jerry's entering the last year of his deal. This draft's ripe with outside pressure talent. So is this a draft where they do take a DE early? See, I look at it a little bit different way. I I have seen, and we have seen actually, over the past three or four years, we've seen the edge rush talent that has come out of college. And it just seems to be getting better and better and better with every year. And obviously it's going to max out at some point, but the cheapest option of going to get one of those guys would be through the draft. So even if they don't get a guy this year, they could still take a guy next year. Now, usually you want to take those guys a year ahead of, where they of the guy that they'd be replacing you know i understand that we start to see the jets and i always always hearken on this all the time we start you have to take care of your own division first so you start to see the jets you know sign all these receivers they got a now and then they got crowder and then they got bellamy 
they got all these guys now, with, and and they got parity to protect protect Darnold. But you see all these things going on, and you all you almost have to kind of strategically like chess pieces in the off season, equip your team to take care of your division first. Um, I think the Dolphins. I, I apologize if there's any Dolphins in this chat. If there's any Dolphins in this chat, you're probably in the wrong chat. But uh, <laughs> they're just they're just kind of a mess right now. I mean, they're just yeah. they're just all over the place, and the Patriots are obviously going to be the Patriots. They're going to be tough to beat every year. However, you have to try to equip your team, and with the amount of defensive talent that's going on in this draft, where, and I'm going to bring up a name, and no one, guys, don't crucify me for this, but I'm going to bring up Doug Whaley, and we talked about it on an episode this week. Doug Whaley was many things, but the one thing that he was really good at was scouting linebackers, so he was able to take linebackers third, fourth, fifth round and make them into something. Sean McDermott is like that with cornerbacks. He has a defensive back background. He has Leslie Frazier, who was a defensive back. They know how to scout and get talent in the defensive secondary. And they may see something in Johnson, and they could probably take a guy in the fifth or sixth round and turn him into – look what they did with Levi Wallace, who wasn't even drafted. So they're able to do that with this, some of this defensive talent they're able to acquire. Plus, they still keep their eye on the waiver wire of what goes on. We were able to get Isaiah McKenzie. We were able to get Jordan Phillips and then re-sign Jordan Phillips. So they are very active in a lot of the things that they do, not just through the draft or not through, just through free agency. They are still able to acquire a lot of this talent and be successful with that talent, even though they're not high-name guys that you need. So at nine, I think if they don't trade back, they're going to go after a guy that they, they know can make an impact right away. And the biggest impact position on this Bills team has to be at the offensive line. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I am a bit more thinking that the offense is going to be the focus of the draft. But again, you, you know how this goes, right? Yeah. Sometimes you just can't help yourself. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure if that was going to be one of the case um, or if that's what we were going to run into. Now, there is rumors flying around, and Tom Hampton brings it up, of not only did the Jets get Anthony Barr, but they're also in talks with C.J. Mosley, which – terrifies me now this is the off season i'm not i don't tell me to stop listen I'm done. all right this, no, I said, I'm these done. are all rumors if they get mosley and Barr, i quit i'm just telling well, you well and you know but this <laughs> is I, I think it's important to frame what we're looking at right because um the jets this is what they do they go out and they spend a ton of money at all times their solution is to always spend money right <laughs> that's that's how the jets have always solved their problems regardless of who's in charge that's how they've always solved their problems is we're going we're gonna to spend as much money as possible to fix our team. The Bills are a bit more pragmatic, and I don't disagree with that approach because, again, you look at the roster now. There's 60 guys on the roster. What are you doing spending a ton of money in positions that you don't necessarily have to fill? Right? you got a young team. You're not going to be super aggressive in free agency because you're going to have some of these younger contracts starting to roll off, and then maybe next season they're super aggressive in free agency. I don't see a problem with their approach. Uh, Kevin Johnson, I, I know that some people scratch their heads when he got signed, but um, if he's the guy that you really wanted and you said, you know, we, need, I, we really want to give this guy a chance, what's the problem signing him first? Just you, you, you cross that right off your board. Say, okay, we can now look at undrafted free agents, for corners, we're, we're fine with where we sit right now. Um, I don't really have a problem with the approach there. But, uh, again, to cycle back to some of the comments here, um, Dan Ugaris asked any word on Golden Tate, Robert uh, Morlock, any word on John Ross. Um, let's see here. There was some more. Um, oh, Justin Houston and Sheldon Richardson, are they a fit on the bills? Um, so there's a lot of names that are still floated around a lot. Um what do you think about Justin Houston? Again, another Andy Reid connection, right, which we're very familiar with in Buffalo at this point. Yeah. Um, but here's a guy that, again, missed time due to injury. And we've seen that you know, system be established where the Bills aren't afraid to sign a guy to that. Do you think? What do you think about Justin Houston if you lose the C.J. Mosley battle? Because I would love to see C.J. Mosley here. I think the dynamic that he would bring across your linebacker core would allow you to be immensely versatile. You give a ton of different looks from a defensive standpoint. But what if you do get Justin Houston? How does that change uh, what you're going to do? And what kind of commitment are you looking at for a guy that, again, has missed a ton of time? But when he's available, he's, he's an outstanding player. But he's not often available. No, I, and I just got to hearken to the chat real quick because uh, Brett commented in. He said, I'd rather take an offensive lineman, but, D, but DK Metcalf kind of reminds me of the wide receiver version of Josh Allen. 
These Ooh. guys love the fact that they can coach players up. I don't know how you coach hips, but as far as trying to get to the speed of the game, I, I believe these guys try to coach them up. But then Jonathan Provost said, screw the Bills approach, Paul. <laughs> I know, right? I know. That was pretty I know. good. Um, it, as far as the reasons why you and I were so high on guys like Barr and Mosley was that you could play them anywhere. I think if you get Houston, he's only relegated to one side of the field or the other. Um, we've seen Milano take some snaps at Mike Linebacker. We've seen Tremaine Edmonds is the guy that they want to be their Mike Linebacker for the next 10 years. Um, but if you, were to dra- if you were to try to get a Mosley, you can intertwine those guys on both sides of the field and in the middle. I think Houston doesn't give you that kind of versatility. Now, as far as uh, you, know, you mentioned Sheldon Richardson, and we had mentioned earlier on a, on a video of ours earlier this week, if you're willing to take the risk to sign an Antonio Brown, you're comfortable with your culture in your locker room to take a big-name personality like that. Richardson has proven to be that type of guy. But I have no qualms about putting Richardson next to Star Tule and having them just create havoc in the middle as far as that is concerned. But as far as Houston goes, I do have a little bit of trepidation. If he didn't have such an injury history like you mentioned, I know the Andy Reid connections there. That that always that always plays a big part in whether or not they want to sign guys. My problem would be he's not as versatile as those other linebackers. And number that's number one. Number two, what would he want to get paid to come to Buffalo? That's always the biggest question because one of the things that you brought up, um, which is huge, because Buffalo really is, if you think about it, the only New York team, and the tax involved. I mean, not only not many people want to talk about it, but the tax that's involved with these guys' contracts that they have to pay, you even mentioned on a previous episode that we had that Mario Williams had that built into his contract that for the, for the New York taxes. That's why his contract was so huge. You know, it was like, you care to elaborate and, and for the chat on that? Because that's, that's a huge, that's a huge bargain. Yeah, yeah. It is, right? So that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the Jets and the Giants aren't actually in New York. They're in, they're in Denver, New Jersey, right? So the Buffalo is the only team that's actually physically built in um, in New York. Um, and what ends up happening is whenever you are working in New York, you have to pay New York state income tax. So that's why when, you know, like Mario Williams is an example, let's say the Bills are bidding against Miami. Miami has no state income tax. So a player is going to make, you know, 8% more money in Miami for doing the exact same thing, right? Now, mind you, that's only in the time that they serve and and use uh, use their services in the state of New York. But again, for a football player, I mean, like if you play in Tennessee, like let's say you're playing an away game, you're paying Tennessee state tax, but most of your time is spent in New York if you're with the Bills. So um, it is more expensive to sign in Buffalo uh, for you to make less money because you end up having to pay higher tax rates. Uh, which is kind of crazy, but it absolutely is an impact. I do want to bring up one guy um, that uh, Jonathan Provost calls out, and it's K.J. Wright, who I love. You know me (laughs) and the Seattle linebackers. I sometimes just can't help myself. Um, (laughs) K.J. Wright, um, I think he's 29, if memory serves me right. He only played five games last season. But here's a guy that's been a 100-tackle guy the last four of five seasons. Again, the only time that he's really missed significant time was last year. Um, KJ Wright is a animal, um, yes. and that's a guy that I think would, because of the injury last year, you're probably looking at about three years, fifteen, sixteen million dollars for him. Um, it, there's a lot of teams that are going to want in on that, so you got to be able to offer him something that he can't get anywhere else. Yes. I don't know what that is, but uh, if you go three for sixteen, three for sixteen, five, KJ Wright's all yours right now. You, were, you just mentioned that you were big on uh, Seattle linebackers. Would Ty Powell fall into that category? Ah, <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it, <laughs> Ty Powell. Hey, man, I like the guy. Uh, Daniel Gowry uh, brings up a great point. He says, the cost of living is lower in Western New York. We, we forgot to take into account the fact that that other 8% you're going to be earning living in Miami, trying to buy a house yeah. there versus New York, and it wouldn't work out. There's your other 8% yeah. right there. Yeah, that and I don't. I don't see Buffalo sinking anytime soon, like Miami. Miami's gonna fall into the ocean in another five years. So, you know, just get out, get out of there, get out of there. Um, if, <laughs> funny, more guys don't want to go to Jacksonville. That's kind of funny. <laughs> right. Uh, 
So we run into an interesting scenario with where the Bills are, right? Because we went from uh, just even last week, um, the Bills acquired Antonio Brown. So you're like, okay, wide receivers off the draft board. We can move on. And you're like, well, you know, the Bills are a candidate to trade back into the first round to grab a center. Well, center is now off the board, but wide receiver is back on the board. So uh, with the news that the Bills were willing to trade down in order to acquire Antonio Brown, which, again, no, that's a good deal for them, right, to move back 11 spots and get Antonio Brown. It's a good deal. They were very smart in the way that they handled the negotiations by reaching out to Drew Rosenhaus to see if Antonio Brown would even come here before um, you know, finalizing or continuing any talks. It's, it's, that is a good move. I know it fell apart, but it's still the right move to do. Um, do you think the Bills trade back? If so, how far? And uh, what do you think they're looking for? The, and the reason I bring that up is you know, last time the Bills traded back, um, you know, it, it was for Trey White, who was the fourth corner off the board. Um, so they didn't trade back. They traded into the basement of the first round when they did that. So how far do you think they're comfortable falling? And what do you think are the circumstances surrounding why they would trade back? Um, I got an answer for you on that. I just want to do, I, I, I sent this retweet out earlier on, on Albert Breer. Um, prior to, to, prior to this morning, he said the teams with the tightest to the cap of this eight, of this morning. Okay. The Bucks were at number one. They only had 2.3. And then you had the Saints, Vikings at 4.26, the Falcons at 5.9, the Chiefs at 8.2, Steelers at 9.25, Eagles 15, Panthers 15, Redskins and Ravens, okay? So what you see from that is you see five teams in there that the Bills have familiarity with, that they have they have traded with the Bucks. That's how we got Josh Allen. They've traded with the Ravens. That's how we got Tremaine Edmonds. They have familiarity with the Panthers. They have familiarity with the Eagles and the Chiefs. So there's five teams. Maybe the Vikings they've talked to because, I mean, you know, they were, or the Falcons, I mean, because being in McDermott, being in McDermott was down in Carolina. They were in that division. Maybe they've had some talks with, you know, the Falcons in, in that respect. And you start to see where there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams that are in the NFC. That's very important. So five teams you have familiarity with, seven teams that are in, a, in the NFC. These teams are tight to the cap. What do we always mention is the cheapest option to get uh, players is the NFL draft. Now, if these teams have higher draft picks than the Bills, that's who I would look with. You look at the Panthers, I think they have the 15th pick overall or 16th pick. You start to look at them and they, okay, maybe we want to, you know, the Bills maybe trade at nine. Who knows? You know, or, or they stay at nine. But then they want to get back and and they offer a second and a, a next year's a second and third or something like that. So, in order to, for them to not have that big of a cap hit on their first round pick, and they and, and there's a guy at 16 that they're like, well, we don't want this guy. We're looking for def defensive talent. Um, and there's you know a couple of these offensive guys on the board. Maybe they want to trade out of that pick. The Bills have familiarity with a lot of teams that are really tight to the cap. They could trade back into the first round. So the likelihood of them coming back in the first, I could see that. Um, as far as trading back initially, that's another thing that they could do. If one of these teams just wants to jump up and they think they're one player, what the Saints might do it. I mean, the Saints have been next to the cap for how many years, however, however long Nicky Loomis has been the GM down in, in New Orleans. They've been tight to the cap all the time. So yeah. it, it's interesting to see a lot of the teams that are really tight to the cap, the Bills have a lot of familiarity with and could take contracts of those players off of their hands. Now, you had mentioned, and we had mentioned the income tax and all that stuff. It's hard to get players here via free agency to have them willingly come here. But if they're traded, they don't have a choice. If they're traded right. here, then we, get, we acquire their services. They have no option in, in the deal. So... I think the Bills in the first two drafts that Bean and McDermott have controlled are, I mean, the one the one McDermott was and then Bean was there. They they like moving and shuffling. So this could be one of those things. Bean has already said when I, whether or not he was posturing. He said, you know what, we don't need the ninth pick. You know, we're, we didn't, you know. So that could be a possibility. I say it's a very high probability that they're going to trade out of there. So mm -hmm. how many times they do trade, what they give up for it, who knows. They do have a lot of middle round picks, um, and you know, like we've talked about before, the fifth, sixth, and seventh round is just something that you see it in a, something intriguing trade about a player, and you want to take a flyer on him, have him play special teams, and see if he bumps up from there. But 
Yeah, I could see them moving around all day. Well, I, I think it's important to call out, and uh, Jason Antonucci points this out. Um, you know, you you got to leave free agency with something, right? You got you probably are looking. And I think he's right. Um, he mentions you got to leave free agency with wide receiver and defensive tackle. I'm I'm with you there. Uh, I think you also have to leave with a little bit more line depth. I think you have to get another tackle uh, somewhere along free agency. But I think it's also important to remember that the Bills don't need this draft capital that they have. They've got no. a full team right now, right? They've got more than a full team. So a lot of the players that were on the team at the end of last year aren't going to make it. Uh, they're not going to make the 53-man roster. That, and that's just a fact. Uh, they got 60 guys right now. So um, plus they're going to add another 10 in the draft. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bills uh, make moves to add draft capital next season, you know, mm. leverage some of the picks that they have this year and trade them into picks for next season. Um, because, again, you just it's a numbers game right now. You've got a lot of players on this roster, and you're going to have to make some moves sooner or later. Um, and having 10 picks this season, I mean, at this point, you have 10 picks. Well, what, only five of them are going to make the roster? Four of them are going to make the roster? If that's the case, then why even have them? Trade them for capital in later years if you can. Um, so either they're going to use picks to bundle um, and move up, or they're going to be sliding picks out uh, to try and uh, acquire capital for next year. If the Bills do trade on a nine uh, and trade down, um, I, I don't expect them to acquire any picks this season for that. Right? They, you know, I, if they let's say they trade it down to fifteen as an example. I would expect them to grab a third next season, right? Yeah. I, I don't think that we're going to see a lot of, uh, of trades on draft day uh, happen that are going to involve picks on the same day. I, I just don't see it happening. I, they got to start looking at, at acquiring picks for next season. It's interesting, too, because you talk about they have 10 picks. I think 10 is the operative number because that is, that is the amount of positions usually that um, if you trade out and you trade back at least 10 spots. Now, if you trade from 4 to 15, if you trade from, like, the Bills are at 9, if they trade back to in the 20s somewhere, we saw it with Trey White, they traded from 10 to 27, you're pretty much banking that you're going to get a first-round talent the next year. I think anything within 10 picks, when you trade back, I think the starting price is a second-rounder. So if the Bills end up going from, well, I agree with you, if you go if you go from 9 to like 16 or 17, I think in that range, you're probably going to pick up not only a third, but I think you're going to pick up a second-round pick as the starting discussion, depending on how bad a team wants to trade up. Now, if the Bills were to, let's say, they go from 9 to 24 with the Raiders, because the Raiders now have you know, three first-round picks, they're actually paying the most in, in, in draft for their rookie class. If they keep all their picks, they're paying $14 million for just for their rookie class, and that number is going to go up. Um, right. I think they're currently forty-four million under the cap. I mean, even if they draft their whole class, they're going to be thirty million under the cap. So they they're almost done with the signings that they've had. If they hold, if they plan on holding on to those picks, if they go under thirty million going into the draft, you could bet they're going to move one, maybe two of those first-round picks if they don't like the guys that are on the board. So if the Bills were to go from nine to twenty-four, I, I would assume that with the amount of contracts that. That Oakland picked up, the Bills will pick up a first round pick next year. So they'll have two first rounds in 2020. And I don't think people can get upset about that. Um, I know a lot of people initially were upset with the, you know, get, giving Patrick Mahomes to Kansas City. The guy threw 50 touchdowns. They threw the ball over the place. You know, we, we've had our discussions with people on that. The fact that Andy Reid and that entire offense is not in Buffalo. So I don't think he would have performed that way here. Um, and that's, that could probably be a discussion for another day. But as far as that goes, the 10, 10 is the huge number to focus on. If the Bills go from 9 to 19 or later, they're going to end up picking up a first-round pick somewhere. Right. And, and, again, you take a look at the capital that they have. Uh, they don't need all these picks, right? The thought process before free agency started was if the Bills weren't going to be able to sign the guys that they wanted, you have all these late picks. You, I mean, you, you start picking off bad contracts. Right. You, mm -hmm. you call the Raiders and say, we just got a B and you've got one year left of Jordy Nelson. I guess we can take that chance. Right. What do you, what do you want? A sixth for him? You're just going to cut him. So it's going to cost you the same amount of money to get rid of him as it yeah. is to to, you know, to trade him, to cut him. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. So, you know, do you want a sixth for him? I mean, that's all right. You know, you, you start making calls like that when you're just trying to fill out the rest of your roster. Uh, you know, the Bills very well could walk away with some flyer material here. 
on players that are out there. But I really, really feel that the Bills have to leave free agency with the tackle. Um, yeah, you picked up Long, who's going to be your swing guard and swing center. He can start for you at guard, but you have to leave with a tackle um, <laughs> because you don't even have the depth on this line. Um, you know, to to risk the fact that you're going to pick up starting tackle in the draft. Um, you, you just don't have the ability to do that. Um, yeah, there's no there's no depth on this team right now. Well, depending on that, if they if they try to have a very control, if they want to have a more controllable contract, I mean, they will pick up a draft and tackle a tackle in the draft. But I mean, what's to say that they um, they sign a couple of these lower level guys at tackle and or guard? Or, t- or tackles that they want to move to guard because that seems to be a natural progression. We talk about players all the time. You know, when, when they're exhausted, their abilities as a tackle, they, they always slide down to guard and they end up getting two or three more years out of their career. Same thing with the secondary. If you're a corner, you play for about 10 years and you start to get, a, you know, a few steps slower. You play safety because you know the game. Um, they could they could do a little bit of posturing in that respect in, in, this, in this free agency period, picking up some very manageable contracts of offensive linemen to get everyone saying, Hey, they're done. They're done with offensive linemen. Um, I, you got mad at me before that. What if they, what if they resign either or both of Mills or Miller? What if that, what if that even happens? I mean, we haven't taken that into account. I understand that's an insane proposal and I'm going to get some hate mail. I understand that. However, they, you know, they were really tight to the cap. They couldn't sign too many guys before free agency hit and, they're going to have all this money and free agency. What if they just – the guys have been in the system. So what's to say that they're not going to be here? Right. Um, there's a new offensive line coach, right? So anything's possible. Yeah. Um, you know, we haven't really seen any um, stragglers stroll in from, uh, you know, from the new offensive line coach. Normally you see one or two guys signed in to play along the line. They're real familiar with them. Uh, we haven't really seen that yet. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure there, you know, um, <laughs> it is, it, the bill. you're trying to be nice right now. You're really, you're really yeah. trying to be nice to me. Cause I just suggested, well, I'm trying that. to no, Cause I completely avoided the question. If Mills <laughs> or Miller are on this team again, I'm going to need you to drive me, use me as a speed bump in the Kia when we record our episodes this week. <laughs> so I'm going to need, um, it could happen. Or it's, uh, I, I know we got a lot of folks uh, that are watching, but um, unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to wrap things up pretty quickly here um, because I, okay. I know we've got tons of content coming in through the chat, and we appreciate all you guys tuning in. Um, but uh, we are we're going to wrap up uh, pretty pretty soon. Dang you! No, um, it, no, I, I understand that. I mean, it's getting it's getting really late. I, I'm surprised. You know what? As always. I mean, we're not ending it right now, but I just, we're going to wrap it up soon. But, guys, thank you for your participation tonight in the chat. I mean, it's quarter to 11 at night. I didn't know we had so many night owls uh, as our subscribers, but I love it. we got a lot of first-time commenters on here and everything. And, it's uh, you know, as always, some great um, football discussions. But you guys are bringing up ideas to us as well. And um, <laughs> Paul trying to be nice but failing badly. He does that often, yeah. Daniel. He really does. <laughs> But, um, no, I think to, to put a nice little bow on the first day of tampering, um, I think the Bills, they, they, they solved a couple things, and they didn't spend more than $19 million on 2019. Uh, as far as the contracts that we see that came out right now, um, I think it's 19. I have to get the, the numbers on uh, Mitch Morris's uh, deal. But uh, uh, yeah, it's 11 it's, mil right they now. said it was very heavily front-loaded. So um, that's good. That's, I mean, that's a good thing because they did the same thing with Star Latulale's contract. I mean, the Bills conceivably could, could cut Latulale after June 1st this year and actually save money, which is weird because he's in the second year of a $50 million contract. So, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the day bowl. Okay. Um, but uh, like, like I said, guys, thank you for joining the chat tonight. We're going to try to do a couple more of these, uh, hopefully earlier in the night, because Paul and I both have very little ones that I probably woke up at this point. Um, but, uh, Paul, do you have anything else to add for this evening? 
No, no, nothing. Um, it's I do want to. Somebody just actually brought, brought this. Chris Matlock said, uh, "Trent Rich, get Trent Richardson." That's actually something that's very much a possibility. <laughs> is that these AAF rosters are going to be graded? Um, and we haven't even talked about those guys yet. Um, so there's oh, probably yeah, going to be will. four or five guys just from the AAF that are going to make their way onto the Bills um, as uh, you know roster invites. Uh, but again, if you consider where they sit, there's not many not many places on this roster for them to be. Um, but there's there's some players on the AAF that'll probably make their way. I don't think Trent Richardson's going to be one of them. Uh, but there's some guys there we can take them yeah, um, as could. we get closer. Um, I feel uh, fair to warn everybody that in just uh, what is it eight hours uh, we're going to have our next video posted. We're giving you our free agency draft kit. Uh, some of the things that we talked about today and some of the things that. Um, you, you need to be prepared for in this tampering period and when free agency does open. Uh, it's going to be even more insane than today because, because remember, a lot of the things that were talked about today, these are reported, reported going to sign because they officially can't sign any of these free agents because they're not technically free agents until 4 p.m. on Wednesday. So be, be sure that you know there's a couple of players that, oh, this guy's going to sign here for this much money. Well, if another t- player comes in over their, over their you know bid, doesn't likely happen, but it could. So I just want to prepare you for that. And um, as always, thank you, thank you guys. Even though we're not in the car, thank you for riding with us tonight.